starting us off with number 10 are the Dropa stones. Now misleadingly, they aren't stones at all, but circular stone discs. The discs dated back around 12,000 years when they were first found in the early 60s, and there was a whopping 716 of them. Each one was around one foot in diameter, with two grooves coming from the hole in the center. They also have tiny hieroglyphic markings inside the grooves that we've never seen before. In 1962, Sum Umnui said he had managed to decipher the message and that it told the story of a spaceship that crashed into the cave they were found in and that the shape had dropa people in it who couldn't fix the discs and hence had to adapt to life on earth. He believed the discs came from space because one glyph in particular said this, the dropa came down from the clouds in their aircraft. Our men, women and children hid in the caves 10 times before sunrise. When at last we understood the sign language of the dropas, we realized that the newcomers had peaceful intentions. The weirdest part is that the discs were reported to have been displayed around many museums in China, but none of them have any traces of the Dropa stones ever being there. Moreover, there's no record of Sum Um Nui being a Chinese name or any link to him and the stones outside of China. So on one hand, we don't even know where the discs came from, and on the other, we don't even know who the man is who found them. Coming in at number 9 are the String of Lights. In 2005, Leroy Chiao, a former NASA astronaut, was on a spacewalk when he saw strange formation of lights pass him. He said as the sun started rising, he looked in the opposite direction and saw a line of five lights. They flew by quickly in an echelon formation with the second light being slightly out of line. He himself had no idea what they were and he speculated that they were a constellation of satellites or bright lights actually on earth. One aerospace engineer called James Smith theorized what Leo saw may have been squid fishing boats off the coast of South America. They use bright lights to attract the squid and they usually appear on images from weather satellites, so the option is plausible. Either way, to see that in space would have been truly something. At number 8, we have the UFO sighting. So back in 2015, NASA was accused of stopping their live feed from the International Space Station just as the UFO came into sight. It's hard to tell in the video, but a tiny grey circular object rises and then disappears in the footage right before the cutoff. I mean, it could also totally not be a UFO, but it's still an unidentified flying object, so make of that what you will. Dr. Brian O'Leary, an ex-NASA astronaut, said there's abundant evidence that we're being contacted and that civilizations have been visiting us for ages. Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth person on the moon, said there has been crashed craft and bodies recovered. We aren't alone in the universe, they've been coming here for a long time. These are their words, not mine. Filling our number 7 slot is Oumuamua, or its official name A-2017 U. In 2017, the PanStars 1 telescope saw something zoom into our solar system. It's the first object ever that came from outside our solar system. At first they thought it was an asteroid or a comet due to its orbit, but they concluded it was from interstellar space. As soon as they found it, multiple telescopes around the globe focused in on it for three whole days. It was a rotating object the size of a football field, literally it was 10 times longer than it was wide, and it changed in brightness dramatically. Dramatically. It seemed to be a long cigar shaped object with a reddish hue that came from millions of years of radiation from cosmic rays and it spun on its axes every 7.3 hours. Its Hawaiian name Oumuamua means a messenger that reaches out from the distant past, which is pretty fitting if you ask me. Now, astronomers have figured out that the object came from the direction of Vega, which is a star in the Lyra constellation. But given that Oumuamua is traveling at 85,700 miles per hour, it would have taken a long time to travel that distance and Lyra obviously isn't in the same place it was 300,000 years ago so we really have no idea where it really originates from. We're trying to track it for as long as possible, it passed Mars and Jupiter's orbit and it recently just passed Saturn's in January of 2019. It's en route to the Pegasus constellation and to be out of ours for a very long time. Now at number 6 is the music. In May of 1969, the crew of Apollo 10 and heard some sort of outer space type music as they passed over the far side of the moon. They had been cut off from contact with Houston, so the three of them listened to this alone, and when communication channels reopened, they didn't mention the incident because they were worried the land crew would be concerned about their psychological state. The noise sounds like a low frequency whistling noise. For one hour, the astronauts and the recording talk about the weird tune, but can come up with no explanation for it. Some say maybe it was an alien orchestra or the sound of a vessel near 
nearby. While radio technicians guess it's probably from signal interference between the lunar modules and the command modules VHF radios. Which probably is the right answer, I'm not gonna lie. Just doesn't sound like an alien orchestra. <laughs> Coming in at number five is the green orb. Now, Major Gordon Cooper was orbiting the Earth in the Mercury capsule as part of the Mercury missions. However, during the mission, he said he witnessed a green orb coming towards him. He quickly called mission control and started the emergency procedures, but the orb then randomly just disappeared. Even a tracking station in Muchi, Australia, picked up an object approaching the capsule, so it definitely existed and it was definitely there. Yet we have no explanations for this space orb. At number 4 is the flying object. In March of 1991, Russian cosmonaut Musa Manarov filmed a very strange occurrence from the Mir space station. Way behind the station in the distance there seemed to be a weird white reflective object. From what I could tell it was a vertical spacecraft that was almost reflecting light off of it every few seconds. At one point the reflection light turns a reddish colour and then the craft changes from vertical to horizontal and continues news moving. The footage I watched came from the archives of the Soviet space authorities, so at least we know that it's legit. Most critics tried to argue the video was simply some space junk, but Musa vehemently disagreed. Filling our number 3 slot is the Millennium Falcon. Now while watching the ISS NASA live feed back in 2016, Jaden Beeson said he saw a metal spaceship. He said the UFO that he saw seemed similar to the Millennium Falcon found in Star Wars, so he realised he definitely needed to take a screenshot to prove what he was seeing. The metal craft had a blue glow to it and stayed hovering above earth for about 2 minutes. It's very clear to see it's not a small craft by any means. Either way Jaden sent the image to NASA but has not gotten any explanation or response back. Which makes the whole thing even more suspicious. Are all these crafts just hovering above earth and then just going away? Why? Please just come in you guys. We are friends. Friends of ET. Friends of extraterrestrials. <laughs> now at number 2 are the Dropa Stones in Space. Didn't think that one would make a comeback in the video now did you? Back in 2006, NASA taped some debris floating around the shuttle Atlantis on mission STS-115. The first thing seen is a rectangular object that seems to be in the same orbital path as the Atlantis. The debris were donut like white objects that were pulsating with light. Now most people think it wasn't debris at all and that NASA is just saying that when they full well know it's something else. They told the public that maybe the debris were items that had gotten loose from the shuttle or had accidentally discharged from the bay. The Atlantis flight director said it's common to see bits of debris when astronauts open the payload doors at the start of mission but it's unusual seeing objects late in the mission as they did in this case. But the debris had an uncannily similar appearance to the Droba stone shaped things that were found passing the STS-75 mission as well. The stones were miles wide and could be seen behind a 12 mile tether as it went into space and snapped loose. And finally, at number one is Major Vladimir. Now, Major General Vladimir Kovalnyok was a cosmonaut in the 80s who saw something bizarre during the Saljuk mission. They were moving over South Africa when he saw an oval shaped object. Initially, it flew straight, but then an explosion of golden light happened. A few seconds later, the oval object transformed into two golden spheres. After that, Vladimir just saw white smoke and the spheres had just disappeared. He said he tried to take a picture of it, but it exploded just before. Before he could. When he reported to Mission Control, it was all over Soviet headlines, magazines, newspapers, and most people excluded any option of it being extraterrestrial, but it did happen. It has no explanation and it was seen by not one but two people Vladimir and his partner Victor Savink. Number 10, Mariner 1. July 22nd, 1962. An Atlas rocket launch was successful at first. NASA's Mariner 1 spacecraft had hoped to be the first to fly by Venus and get ahead of the Soviet Union in this massive space race. Now, after the launch, it didn't take long for operations to quickly go south. The rocket was unable to steer itself and was heading towards a crash rather than the cosmos. Now, there's two things that could happen here. The rocket either lands into the North Atlantic shipping lanes or an inhabited area. Not ideal. So there's no choice other than to self-destruct. $720 million splashed down minutes later. It turns out this was all caused because one programmer left a hyphen out of one equation. That's how long ago it was, where one hyphen just caused all that damage. Classic. Number nine, Phobos 1. 1998, we'll look over to the Soviet Union for this one. We'll go back and forth. Back in 1998, they launched the Phobos 1 spacecraft to study Mars's moons and even land a probe on Phobos, the largest moon of them. Now on September 2nd, 
1998, mission operators lost contact with the spacecraft and they never heard back. Yeah, it just ghosted them and then drifted away in space. That's, that's a bit rude if you ask me. So what went wrong? Where did it go? Well, software uploaded on August 29th. Well, it turns out somebody missed a single character when they uploaded software on August 29th. Again, a single character caused all this chaos. This put the spacecraft in a steering test mode for some reason, which also deactivated the spacecraft's thrusters. So eventually the solar panels couldn't face the sun anymore and it ran out of battery power and also communication. Drifted away forever and then just died. That's so sad. Number eight, the second shortest spacewalk. Luca Parmitano, an Italian astronaut with the European Space Agency, faced what's possibly my new worst fear. Here we go. July 16th, 2013, not that long ago at all. During a spacewalk on the 36th expedition to the ISS, the International Space Station, Luca's helmet began to fill with liquid. Not water, but rather liquid coolant. Water would be bad alone, just splashing around in zero G, but liquid coolant, you can't even drink that. You know what I mean? I mean, as if you could drink water in the suit, like it's Looney Tunes. Both are bad. The spacewalk continued for over an hour before Luca was back in the ISS and free from his suit of doom. Yeah, he was fine, but this accident could have been a lot worse. The second shortest spacewalk in the station's history. More than fair. Drowning in a weird liquid around your head? I couldn't even imagine. That's my new nightmare. Yep. Number seven, space workout gone wrong. Look, zero gravity. I can't even imagine how hard it is to stay in shape while you're floating on the ISS, just in space. It's funny to watch astronauts work out while they're strapped down to a treadmill, but it's vital for that return trip later on after the space mission is complete. They land back on Earth and they're like, oh yeah, gravity, oops. You know, gotta keep those legs nice and strong. Working out in zero gravity can have its dangers. Back in 1995, astronaut Norman Thagard was working out, getting his lunar leg day in, doing some knee bends, all that good stuff. But while doing so, one of the straps snapped off of his foot and flew upwards, hitting him in the eye. Yeah, gravity or not, that's gonna leave a mark. Thagard then had trouble looking at light from that point on, which when you're in space, that's really not ideal. Just trying to avoid the sun as it's going around you all day long. Oh, that's exhausting. Steroid eye drops helped Thagard's eye ultimately, but it could have been a lot worse. Imagine losing an eye in space. Thor lost that eye in space. You know what I mean? Thor. That's pretty badass either way. Number six, Apollo 1. The first fatal accident in the history of US space flight. Happened on January 27th, 1967. The first manned mission of the Apollo space program. Now, it happened. During a simulated launch, a fire broke out in the command module of Apollo 2. 204 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, ultimately taking the lives of astronauts Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Caffey. Design flaws in the hatch door made it impossible to open in time to save the astronauts. So it was honestly just terrible, terrible situation. Apollo 13 faced issues as well in 1970 when an oxygen tank failed. The crew was supposed to head out to the moon, but they had to obviously return once faced with these impossible tasks. Ron Howard did a movie about it called Apollo 13. Done very well, but again, I, nothing can compare to the real situation, I bet. God, that's so scary. Anything like, all these sound terrifying, don't get me wrong, but like the fact they're happening in space or in like a really tight enclosed area, I'm sweating talking about it. Number five, Soyuz 11. It was April 1971 when the Russians launched the world's first space station, Salyut 11. Three cosmonauts aboard said space station spent three weeks observing, conducting experiments, dare I say, normal space station behavior. But their return trip, however, on June 30th, that's when things took a tragic turn. The space craft made a normal re-entry and a normal landing, but when the ground team opened up the hatch, all three cosmonauts had suffocated. See, what happened was a faulty air vent had opened 30 minutes prior when the descent module separated and the cabin just depressurized, just like that. And from that point on, the Soviet and US space programs would now ensure that their astronauts are always wearing their spacesuits during any phase of any mission where depressurization could possibly occur. Just to be safe, yeah, that's oh, it's terrifying. This is so terrifying. I'm literally sweating doing this list. Couldn't imagine how scary that would be. Number four, Project 1794. This project was created with the goal to build a sort of saucer type aircraft that would be designed to shoot down Soviet attacks. Now the program, which was created in the 1950s, was quite ambitious and had some pretty lofty goals. A team of engineers began trying to build a disc shaped aircraft, but here's the real kicker. They wanted it to be capable of traveling at supersonic speeds at high altitudes. The documents about this project show that they wanted to be able to travel at Mach 4, which is four times the speed of sound, and they wanted it to be able to reach an altitude of over 100,000 feet. At the time, the project was estimated to cost around $3 million, which is around 26 million today. And in the end, of course, the project was canceled in 1961 because the craft failed tests and proved to be aerodynamically unstable, which of course would provide a whole slew of problems going at those high speeds. Yeah, especially supersonic speeds. 
There goes all of our money and equipment. There we go, just scattered all over the desert. Number three, too fast. We're at this stage in life where Teslas are driving themselves and they're driving people to work while they're just chilling on their phones. Not for me, I'm a 10 and two guy forever. That's hands on the wheel, I'm controlling everything. Cause you never know what technology may or may not do, what choice it may or may not make for you. I don't know. On June 4th, 1996, for example, Europe's Ariane 5 rocket launched successfully, but 37 seconds into the flight, the rocket flipped 90 degrees, just out of nowhere. And the onboard computer triggered the self-destruct mechanism just two seconds after that point. Yeah, it just made that call for us. Rather than the launch that we heard earlier where a human made that call, this rocket knew it was going too fast and it dipped. The investigation revealed that some sort of old code wasn't properly adapted for the new Ariane 5. Old code for the Ariane 4 was used for the new body on Ariane 5. That equals problems. Now in this case, the engineers had decided that specific velocity in question was too high to become a real problem. That was only true for the Ariane 4, so things did not work. You live and you learn. Number two, 2001 Genesis. I've personally never been skydiving before because I'm afraid of heights. I don't think I could ever do it. And I'm also so worried about the parachute not opening. I mean, I know that's an obvious, but it's a very real problem and one that we'll sometimes see in NASA projects, believe it or not. NASA's Genesis spacecraft launched in 2001, but it was 2004 when it faced issues. When the solar wind sample carrying probe was descending back to our home base here on Earth, the parachute shoot never deployed. It just smashed down to earth. Remaining samples were contaminated by the desert air. Other samples were of course destroyed on this impact. It was a whole mess. NASA's failure report later on in 2009 then revealed that manufacturers had incorrectly installed the probe's accelerometers into an inverted position. So the spacecraft thought it was going up when really it was going down. Yeah, it's a big yikes. It took five years to get answers. Nobody parachutes for five years. That's the new rule. And finally, number one, the Challenger disaster. There's an entire series on Netflix about this entire situation. It's hard to watch, but it's way more informative than I can be in, you know, 45 seconds. On January 28th, 1986, barely a minute after the space shuttle Challenger lifted off, a malfunction in the spacecraft's rubber seals that separated its rocket boosters caused a fire. And from that point on, everything happened so fast. The blaze quickly spread up the rocket itself and the disaster led to the deaths of all the astronauts on board, including the life of a teacher, Krista McAuliffe. With it being minus three degrees Celsius, the engineering team predicted some sort of failure, but NASA had already delayed this project multiple times, so they wanted to press on anyways. The disaster resulted in the temporary suspension of the space shuttle program. More than fair. Again, if you haven't seen the documentary on Netflix, it's really informative. It's sad, obviously, but it's good to know. Number 10, Zombie Star. While the idea of a human coming back to life and hunting for brains is spooky, to me, the knowledge that dead stars can do the same, even the eating each other part, is both scary and exciting. This is Tycho. A former white dwarf, which is a star that has quote died and gone supernova Exploding into a fantastic show of cosmic energy and matter with the power and brightness of a billion suns And usually a white dwarf will stay dead But not in a binary system where there's more than one star at the center Sometimes these previously deceased stars can come back to life and They do this by feeding off the energy and material from their neighboring star and powering themselves back up Not unlike a zombie eating somebody's brains scientists believe that this may have to do with what they call dark energy as well, which theoretically makes up about three quarters of our universe. But since we have yet to truly detect or understand it, these zombie stars will remain a mystery. But they look super cool, right? Number nine, Alien Bones. Captured on August 14th, 2014 by the Curiosity rover, this photo appears to show something on the surface of Mars that could chill you to the bone, a femur on the surface of the red planet. Many conspiracy theorists and alien enthusiasts alike hopped onto this to show it as proof that there was once life on Mars, or even that humans had been there before on some sort of secret mission that went awry. NASA has gone on the record to say that it's not a thigh bone, but just a rock that happened to be shaped that way after erosion from wind or water, which we have proven existed at one point, but come on. If it really was a bone, do you think that they'd tell us? Though I'm inclined to go with the scientists on this one, it would be kind of cool if we had proof of aliens on Mars. If you think there are aliens out there, hit the like and subscribe buttons to help us bring you the most amazing videos on them. Number eight, Eye of Sauron. The Rings of Power just finished its first season as I'm recording this video, and since I still have Tolkien on the brain, this photo of the Fomal Hut system made the cut. A relatively young system at 440 million years old, for comparison, our sun is about 4.5 billion years old, Fomal Hut and its 
surrounding disk of space dust have been the subject of a lot of controversy in the astronomical community. The images captured interest scientists not only because they look like they came straight from Mordor, but because of the zombie planet that has been tricky to find. The photos taken show that the dust ring is not centered around the star, but is shifted and elongated into the eye shape, which indicates something of large mass on the outer parts of the system, which scientists believed could be a Saturn-sized planet. Investigations have been conflicting over the past few years, with researchers believing on and off that the planet exists, and with Hubble images being inconclusive, which is why we call it a zombie planet, because it keeps coming back to life in a way amongst researchers. The system may have gotten its strange ring shape from all of the comet activity as well, with over 2,000 comet impacts daily, many of those comets being over one kilometer wide. That would definitely kick up a lot of dust, so one does not simply walk into Fulmahut. Number 7. Sunken Okay, I threw this one in because it's currently spooky season while I record this, and having a jack-o'-lantern sun on the list couldn't be passed up. In 2014, the Solar Dynamics Observatory captured this creepy photo of the sun smiling right at us, like its features had been carved right out of a pumpkin. Solar flares and activity on the sun can be quite unpredictable, and the fact that it lined up to look like this is pretty cool. I just hope that there isn't some giant alien up there carving into our sun to decorate their intergalactic porch. But if that's the case, what are we going to dress up Earth as? If Earth had a Halloween costume, what would it be? Let me know in the comments. Number 6. Greater Pumpkin Galaxies Sticking with the Halloween theme, 120 million light years away in the Canis Major constellation, these two galaxies, called NGC 2292 and 2293, have earned a much cooler name, the Greater Pumpkin Galaxies. Because of their orange color and the fact that they look like a jack-o'-lantern, these galaxies doomed to collide in what we will see as slow motion make for a pretty spectacular image. Not to mention that NASA released the photos on Halloween a few years ago. Though it may be a fun Halloween themed image, there is a scary truth about them. They're on track to collide with each other. And as the two galaxies draw closer, they begin to spin around one another and could eventually form one single spiral galaxy. But when that happens, there will be some cosmic consequences. Things smashing into each other at ludicrous speeds and exploding out into the darkness with the force of many nuclear bombs. But we don't actually know what will happen until it does. While some may say it reminds them of the Great Pumpkin, I would say that it looks more like 100,000 light year across Jack Skellington. Number 5. The Face of Mars This freaky famous photo was taken by the Viking 1 orbiter in 1976 and shows us what is very clearly a face embedded in the surface of Mars. A massive one at that, judging by the scale of what's around it. It very clearly has two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Uncanny, really. Especially for being what NASA has called a cosmic coincidence. Because with enough time and space, literally anything can happen. When investigated again in 2001 with a better camera, it was not to be seen. Was it just a mound of rocks and dirt that was blown or moved away, or was it something more sin- or was it something more sinister, watching us from the red planet, not knowing that we were finally looking back? Number 4. Black Hole in the Milky Way Black holes, one of the biggest driving forces in the cosmos. These places of pure darkness were once stars that shone bright in the sky, but when they died, instead of going supernova and exploding into a blast of color and energy, they collapsed in on themselves, creating a singularity so dense that it sucks everything around it in, with a force that nothing can escape, not even light. And while this may sound scary, they are incredibly necessary for our understanding of the universe to function. In fact, there are a few in our galaxy, but the biggest is Sagittarius A, the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. This is the second image ever captured of a black hole, and it's insane that we've developed the technology to be able to find and photograph them. Sag A sits at the center of our galaxy and is the reason why it spins and has its signature spiral shape. But the scary part is that it is not only spinning our galaxy, but consuming it, adding one more way that our galaxy can meet its demise. Not sure I'd rather that or colliding with another galaxy. Either way, none of us are going to be around to see it. Number 3. Hand of God. This is what's known as a pulsar wind nebula, and what you're seeing is a cloud of material that was ejected from a dying star, captured by X-ray telescopes functioning at different energy levels. Lower energy detections appearing in red and green, and higher ones in blue. While we can explain what this stellar specter is made of, we can't quite figure out why it takes the shape it does, and NASA is still wondering if the pulsar particles are interacting in a specific way to make it look like a hand. When the new readings were taken, the ones appearing blue, they realized that one part of the hand is actually shrinking at a different speed than the rest, implying that the two areas were physically different, and making us all wonder what the hand is reaching towards. Number 2. Ghost Nebula Known formally as SH2-136, really rolls off the tongue, this reflection nebula has some pretty startling shapes appearing within it. A reflection nebula
Nebula does exactly what you think. It reflects light from nearby stars and galaxies. The energy from stars nearby is not strong enough to ionize the gas of the nebula, but it is enough to illuminate the dust and make it visible to us. Looking at the picture, it's a no-brainer why it's earned its much cooler name, the Ghost Nebula. You can see little figures waving from the edge of the space cloud. They even appear to have horns. I'm not sure what that's about, but I'm here for it. Give me all the spooky space specters. Again, this is just one of those cosmic coincidences that we can't explain, and that if we existed at any other place in the universe, we may not see. So we're pretty lucky, I guess. But let's hope our luck holds out for our final entry. Number one, roaming black holes. Now, I told you about black holes, those things that suck in and destroy anything that comes near, even light, with no chance to escape. But they are pretty detectable, and we should be able to avoid them since they're such a huge cosmic entity, right? Well, what if I told you that there are many out there that are near impossible to detect? because they're moving. That's right. Known as roaming black holes, these death spheres fly through our universe devouring everything in their path. Only detectable by fluctuations in mass and light, they were most likely two black holes that attracted each other, then slingshotted off one another and were flung out into space. But here's the kicker. The Hubble telescope actually detected one closer than anyone would want, in our own Milky Way. While pointed near the center of the galaxy at Sagittarius A, a fluctuation in light and space shows that we may have one of these devouring our galaxy. And we would never see it coming until it was too late. So there you go. One of my, and possibly now one of your fears, roaming black holes. Space is crazy and terrifying. It is absolutely baffling and will never cease to impress me the technology and knowledge we have developed in our time as a species to investigate beyond our own planet. Especially since, at the end of the day, we're all just monkeys with car keys. Number 10, space balls. Over the course of decades, humans have begun to clog up the Earth's surrounding area with space junk. Defunct projects, satellites, broken or discarded pieces of spacecrafts, it will become a serious problem at some point, and it's beginning to show. There have been many instances now of strange metallic balls crashing into the ground and being found in multiple countries. Mexico, Spain, Vietnam, Namibia, Australia, and many others. They hurtle towards the Earth, and some have crashed a little too close for comfort. Most of these mysterious objects seem to just be auxiliary fuel tanks from satellites that were discarded or crashed nearby, and they fell off early, landing in a completely different place than was planned. But some of these, like the one in Mexico, still require more investigation, as they don't match any of the parts that we would have expected to be entering our atmosphere. This one even has an antenna, and reportedly fell from the sky while making strange noises, but was not accompanied by any fire, like a lot of debris entering the atmosphere would have. So where did these things come from then? Number 9. WTF in 2013, the Catalina Sky Survey at the University of Arizona spotted an object in the night sky, and it seemed to have some weird properties. The object didn't move as though it was solid like rock, but it seemed to possibly be hollow. And it had a density of about 10% that of water, and it seemed to be about 6.5 feet in diameter, large enough to house a person. But this didn't match any of the space junk that space agencies had been tracking for previous years, and adding even more to the confusion, the object seemed to disappear from sight, and it was not seen again until two years later when it was officially given the name WT1190F, or WTF for short. Pretty fitting. Video and photos were taken of the object's re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, which was a scientific feat on its own, but the object was never recovered. It is assumed that it burned up from the immense heat of re-entry, but many people believe that it crashed into the ocean and whatever was inside was either captured or lies in wait at the bottom of the sea. Like those UFOs NASA admits that they found. Remember those? That was crazy. Number eight, struck by a space rock. All right, we've got two stories here, and you can either think of them as the result of a curse or karma or cosmic coincidence, but either way, these two women had a bad day. In 2001, Lottie Williams was exercising in a park in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when she looked up and saw a great ball of fire in the air. It was a rocket coming back towards Earth. She watched it approach, and as it got larger in the sky, she expressed her worry to her friends, but then it broke up into pieces, and it was no longer visible to her. A few moments later, she felt what she described as a tap on her shoulder, and and then something fell to the ground. This small blackened piece of metal had fallen from the rocket and just grazed her, and it could have been a lot worse, but she walked away being the first person to be hit by man-made space debris. 
But another woman was not as lucky. On November 30th, 1954, Ann Hodges was napping in her Alabama home when a piece of meteorite crashed through her roof and struck her in the side. It left a three foot wide hole in her roof and also left a massive bruise on her thigh and hand where she was hit. Luckily, the damages were only surface level, and though she went to the hospital the next night, it was because of her stress, not the injury. But if the space rock had been a few inches to the side, Anne would not have lived to tell the tale as the first person to be struck by a meteorite. I'm not sure if she's cursed with extremely bad luck or has really good luck. I'll leave that up to you. Number 7. Skylab Launched by NASA as the first American space station, Skylab was cursed with issues from the moment it launched. The station strapped to a Saturn V rocket sustained severe damage during its deployment, including the loss of the station's micrometeoroid shield and one of its main solar panels, requiring it to have the first ever repair to an object in space, which is pretty cool. But it was again hit with problems when one of the pieces destabilized from orbit earlier than expected and crashed back to Earth. But it doesn't stop there. Due to increased solar activity, Skylab actually ended up falling towards Earth a year earlier than it was supposed to. There was supposed to be a shuttle mission to boost it back into orbit, but the shuttle wasn't ready in time. In an international media frenzy, the Skylab crash was everywhere. People had shirts with targets, contests were made to bring pieces of the wreckage for cash prizes, and people waited for the show. Due to a 4% calculation error on re-entry, the station did not burn up as quickly as expected and pieces fell into Australia only 300 miles from Perth in an almost completely unpopulated area. Man, talk about a crash and burn. These scientists missed the mark so many times it's impressive the thing even hit Earth. Number 6. 300 million year old machine part in 2013, a Russian man named Dmitry was adding coal to a fire when he noticed something strange. A shiny piece of metal was sticking out of the rock, and when he broke open the piece of coal, he found what seemed to be a piece of a metal bar with teeth, like a piece of a gear. When analyzed, it was found to be made of aluminum with about 3% magnesium, an alloy that is not generally produced today. Not only that, but further examination shows machining marks, implying that it's a man-made piece, and it's similar to those that we may find in a modern microscope or other small machinery. But no one can explain how a seemingly man-made part appears in a piece of coal that was 300 million years old. So was this thing a remnant of a past unknown civilization? Maybe something from a time traveler or alien? One explanation is that it could have fallen to Earth from a meteorite all that time ago, but it wouldn't explain the fact that it seems man-made. This little hunk of metal continues to baffle scientists today. Number 5. Nuclear Nuisance the Cosmos 954 reconnaissance satellite launched by the Soviet Union in 1977 had some major issues. The launch went fine, unlike Skylab, its deployment also went off without a hitch, and this long-term orbital satellite seemed like another mission success for the Soviet space program. It was meant to be circling the globe for years and years, but just three months later, the North American Aerospace Defense Command noticed the satellite making erratic maneuvers, changing the altitude of its orbit by up to 50 miles, and in secret meetings, the Soviet officials warned their US counterparts that they had lost control over the vehicle, and the system, which was intended to propel the spent nuclear reactor core into a safe disposal orbit, had failed. And just four months after its launch, it fell towards the Earth, right over Canada's Northwest Territories. The Soviets claimed that it had completely disintegrated upon re-entry, but that was not the case, as we discovered a 600 kilometer path of debris leading through the country. And a huge portion of it was radioactive because they failed to launch the reactor out. We Canadians began Operation Morning Light, a recovery effort that lasted over a year and for which we billed the Soviet Union six million dollars, though they only ever paid us three. Many small pieces of debris were collected as well as 12 large portions of the satellite, only two of which were not radioactive. Number four, proof of panspermia. The theory of panspermia is that life did not naturally begin on Earth, but that it began with microbes stuck in space ice that fell to Earth on meteorites. And the amount of debate around this topic is huge. And we have a few examples that may just prove the theory. The Polonarua meteorite was one that fell in Sri Lanka in 2012. And meteorites are always a good find, but this one was different. 12 days after it was witnessed falling through the sky, a scientist published a paper stating that after studying some electron micrographs, his team discovered fossil 
fossilized diatoms, microscopic phytoplankton inside the meteorite. In addition, his team of scientists reported in a separate article that they are, they are certain that it is a meteorite that originated from a comet that also contained living diatoms. The microbes were remarkably similar to those found on Earth, leading to a debate on whether it was simply contaminated from the Earth's surface. But there is another example with even stronger proof of microscopic alien life. In 2018, a meteorite landed on a frozen lake in Michigan, and when it was examined, thousands of organic compounds that were formed billions of years ago were found. It helped that the quick recovery, along with the cold temperature, kept the water inside frozen for studying. Research is still being done, but this find has thrown the scientific world for a loop. Hopefully the organisms don't leave us with some alien curse or disease. Number 3. The Chelyabinsk Meteor Many of us will remember the 2013 meteor that rocked the world. At 20 meters in diameter, it was the largest natural object to enter our atmosphere since the Tunguska event, which destroyed a wide, remote, forested, and, and very sparsely populated area of Serbia. The Chelyabinsk meteor also is the only meteor confirmed to have resulted in many injuries, though they were all from indirect causes. There are many videos of the event and they are truly terrifying, especially when you learn that the meteor was completely undetected until it entered our atmosphere, which caused worldwide panic. The flash as it began to burn up was brighter than the sun, and when it exploded midair, the energy output was equivalent to the atomic weapon used on Hiroshima, sending out a massive shockwave that damaged buildings and was felt and heard for hundreds of miles. All of the 1,500 people injured were hurt while running or from broken glass or other indirect factors of the meteor. There was even another meteor which was detected to have a close approach on the same day, which was 10 meters larger and flew by us only 16 hours later. Man, February 15th, 2013 was a busy day for meteors. Number 2. Oumuamua Discovered by the University of Hawaii's PanSTARRS-1 telescope in 2017, Oumuamua is the first known interstellar object to visit our solar system. It was originally classified as a comet, but there were no signs of cometary activity after we witnessed it slingshot past the sun at a blistering speed of 196,000 miles per hour, or 87.3 kilometers per second. It was briefly classified as an asteroid until new measurements found it was accelerating slightly, which is very strange for any interstellar body. This massive cigar-shaped object is nearly a quarter mile long, or 400 meters, and its elongated shape is unlike anything we've witnessed in our solar system. Observation has shown that it may have come from the star system of Vega, though with the speed it was moving, it would have taken over 300 million years to make the journey to our solar system, and Vega was nowhere near that position at that time, leading to further questions. Many scientists believe that this could actually be an alien superstructure, as its strange journey and acceleration are studied more and more. Paul Kotis, manager of the Center for Near-Earth Object Studies at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, said that it's a strange visitor from a faraway star system, shaped like nothing we've ever seen in our own solar system neighborhood. Whether it's just an interstellar asteroid or someone coming to see what's up with Earth, we may never know, as it's being launched away from us after making a slingshot maneuver around our sun, the angle and trajectory of which some use as proof as the object being controlled or even driven by some. Something. And finally, we reach our number one, the Hypatia Stone. The Hypatia Stone is one of the single greatest astronomical discoveries that we have ever made. Found in the Sahara Desert by Ali A. Barakat, this is no ordinary meteorite, but one that contains the remnants of a rare type of supernova. Some have even described it as a supernova in a bottle. Named after the ancient mathematician and astronomer Hypatia, who is the first female scholar in her field to have her life and accomplishments recorded, overcoming sexism in the process, scientists are still learning more about its origins. It's believed that the stone was born in what is known as a Type 1a supernova, a rare kind of supernova where a dying star or white dwarf begins to leach energy off of a nearby star and regains energy in the process. These so-called vampire stars circle each other until the white dwarf has recovered enough energy to reignite the stellar reaction actions and explodes in a massive cloud of dust and pure energy, shooting things imbued with strange elements out into the ether. Measuring the metals found inside the stone is how we verified that it came from this kind of supernova, and that it crashed to Earth nearly 28 million years ago after being launched through space by the explosion. Having a supernova in our hands has helped us answer so many questions about the physics of space, but if you ask me, if there was one interstellar item that could have an alien curse, it's the rock that contains pieces of a rare supernova. Sounds like something an alien from Doctor Who would need to power their death machine or something. In our number 10 spot today, we have Claude Maurice Marcel Vorilhan, or 
Rail. Rail is a French journalist who is also the founder of what is called the Raelian Movement, which is a UFO cult. Apparently, Rail had some sort of extraterrestrial encounter in December of 1973, and this is what led him to found this movement. Rail says that during his alien encounter, the alien told him that he was the chosen one and he needed to spread the message to the people on Earth. This UFO cult believes that humans were created by an alien species, and once we find a way to find peace on Earth, those aliens will come down and tell us our true origins and bring us to utopia. In our number 9 spot today, we have Marshall Applewhite. Marshall and his former partner, Bonnie Nettles, were responsible for founding the cult called Heaven's Gate. If you haven't heard of it before, these two believed themselves to be something called walk-ins, which they said are higher beings who took control over the bodies of two middle-aged human bodies so as to spread their word and teach humanity. Crazy thing is, there are people who believed it, unfortunately, because they were manipulated and taken advantage of. They gave up their lives and all worldly possessions in the belief that Earth was to be recycled and the only way to continue surviving would be to leave immediately. The time to leave Earth came in March of 1997 when Marshall claimed that they had a spacecraft that was traveling to the comet Hale Bopp. The catch with this spacecraft, however? Well, Marshall told them that they all needed to stage taking their own lives in order for the UFO to take them to, quote, another level of existence above humans. 39 members of the cult, including Marshall himself, took their lives over the course of a few days. This is the largest event of its kind, next to the Jonestown Massacre. In our number 8 spot today, we have Ernest Norman. Ernest and his wife Ruth are credited with being the founders of what is called UNARIUS, which is an acronym for Universal Articulate Interdimensional Understanding of Science. This group believes in immortality of the soul and that all beings have been reincarnated many, many times. They also believe that in the past, the solar system was the home to an ancient interplanetary civilization, and that aliens are human beings who have lived on Earth as well as other planets, even those outside of our solar system. These aliens are said to be advanced, intelligent beings that exist on higher frequency planes. These aliens are more advanced than humans, both spiritually as well as scientifically. The group is definitely best known for their predictions of UFOs landing on Earth, but they are also known for their, quote, spiritual teachings. In our number 7 spot today, we have L. Ron Hubbard. Scientology is a set of beliefs and practices that were invented by L. Ron Hubbard, and it has been variously defined as a cult. The core belief of this group is that humans are immortal and that our bodies are essentially just a shell to house us. Prior to landing in our human shells, however, this cult believes that our souls belonged to other extraterrestrial lives and that this life here on Earth is just one of many. Of course, that part in the text is only released to you once you spend $200,000 on the cult. This group is quite controversial, not only for the beliefs of the group, but because of their illegal activities activities that also occur, like fraud or spying on the government. There have been numerous superior court judgments that have not only called this group a dangerous cult, but also a manipulative profit-making business as well. In our number 6 spot today, we have Vinny O. Vinny is a person who thankfully doesn't run a terrifying cult, and is rather a person who is aspiring to be an alien. Vinny has spent thousands and thousands of dollars on cosmetic procedures in order to achieve this alien look, and is even trying to have surgery in order to completely remove their genitals. They want to be completely sexless and even go as far as to remove their nipples and belly button. Vinny explains that when they first moved to Los Angeles, they saw everything around them was about sex and beauty and they just didn't want to be a part of that world. They wanted to be separate from the crowd and embrace unattractiveness and shun sexual objectification, which is why they chose a genderless alien as their muse. In our number 5 spot today, we have Dorothy Martin. The Seekers, also called the Brotherhood of the Seven Rays, were a group who were a part of a UFO religion that existed in the Midwestern United States in the mid 20th century. This group was originally organized by a man named Charles Laughhead, but was led by Dorothy Martin, who was often referred to as Sister Thedra. She believed that a UFO was coming to save them all from a catastrophe on December 21st, 1954, and this cult is often thought to be one of the earliest UFO religions. Of course, the UFO did not come, and while this made some members quite skeptical, others began to believe that they just had to wait a few more days until Christmas Eve rolled around. When the second incident was a failure as well, this caused many people in the group to begin turning their backs to this religion, which is likely one of the reasons the group and its beliefs dissipated. In our number 4 spot today, we have Philip K. Dick. Philip is certainly best known for his science fiction writings as he is the author of 44 novels and 121 short stories, but his stories might have been influenced by what was going on in his own personal life. Fellow writer Brad Steger discussed how 
Philip had written to him in the late 70s to say that he thought he might be what is referred to as a star person. The idea of star people goes back long before our new age ideas, and it is actually often attributed to a belief that comes from indigenous Americans, but of course this idea has been taken and modified to fit into our modern world. The idea is essentially that star people are these sort of alien human hybrids, and this modern version of it was introduced by Brad Steger. He suggests that certain people originated as extraterrestrials and they arrived on Earth either through birth or as a quote unquote walk in to an existing human body. As I mentioned before, Philip wrote Brad suggesting that he believed he may be one of these people, which just might explain the varied philosophical and social questions that can be seen in his writings. In our number three spot today, we have George Van Tassel. George is a man who, in 1947, moved to Giant Rock near Landers in the Mojave Desert in California, and this is where he established a UFO center. Basically, he was a founding member of a UFO religion, and he was interested in collecting and analyzing UFO phenomena and interviewing people who had claimed to be contacted. In 1952, George began claiming that he received a message via telepathic communication and that these messages were coming from an extraterrestrial called Ashtar. And not only this, but he also claimed to receive messages from people who had passed, such as Nikola Tesla, famous alien himself. George would also interpret the Christian Bible as a sort of alien intervention in the evolution of humans, and by this I mean he claimed that Jesus himself was an extraterrestrial. To receive these messages, George claimed that he was using a blend of human capabilities as well as the use of an allegedly advanced form of alien technology. Of course, this technology wasn't for everyone, it required the right person with proper training and proper meditation techniques. In our number two spot today, we have Maxine Dietrich. In the early 2000s, Maxine created the Joy of Satan Ministries, which is an esoteric occult organization that advocates for, quote, spiritual Satanism. This is basically said to be a combination of theistic Satanism, Gnostic paganism, Western esotericism, UFO conspiracy theories, and extraterrestrial beliefs. A lot going on there. Members believe Satan to be, quote, the true father and creator god of humanity, whose desire was for his creations, humanity, to elevate themselves through knowledge and understanding. Basically, at the core of this belief is the idea that there was some sort of ancient conflict between advanced extraterrestrial races and humans on Earth. They also believe that Satan is an alien, and he was able to create Earth humans from some sort of advanced genetic engineering. Aside from these already out there ideologies, are way more insane and extremely harmful beliefs as well. All in all, this is just one belief system that would probably be best to just stay far, far away from. In our number one spot today, we have Heidi Fitko Garth. This is the person who is credited with founding a religious movement that is known as the Atman Foundation. This movement was active mainly on an island in the Canary Islands as well as in Germany. This movement received quite a bit of media attention in 1998 because of a huge scare that occurred. Basically, there were 32 members of this sect that believed they were going to be collected by a spacecraft and taken to a new, unspecified location on another planet. Failing this plan, however, the members were going to take their own lives. This is definitely quite a strange group, and it's unclear if they still exist or not, but hopefully not, considering the spacecraft they were all waiting for likely never came. Kicking off the list at number 10, Wasp96B. Okay, we have to talk about some James Webb goodness in this list, of course. NASA just released a handful of photos from its $10 billion project. This telescope launched last Christmas and the gifts have finally arrived. And I'm terrified, we are so small in the universe. What is going on? In the cluster of photos, we see a giant exoplanet called WASP-96. And no, it is not full of wasps. I mean, I hope not, who's to say? But it could hold secrets behind human existence. WASP-96 is a gas planet half the size of Jupiter, 1,150 years away from us. It orbits its star every three to five days, so I hope you love New Year's parties because you're gonna have a lot of them. Thanks to our boy James Webb up there in space, we can now see that there's lots of water surrounding this planet. Clouds and haze, says NASA, that's good. I'm excited for more water to be found in the universe, but I'm also nervous, because you know, more water means more fish, and you know, also f up aliens. Number nine, Kepler 1649C. 
Yeah, it's not all about James Webb today, okay? NASA's Kepler Space Telescope also discovered this one a while back, but while NASA was revisiting old observations in 2018 before, you know, retiring said telescope, they noticed previous computer algorithms misidentified it. And upon second glance, it's indeed an exoplanet. Yep, 300 light years away from Earth, it's a tad larger than our planet, and it receives a good amount of starlight. It receives about 75% of what our own sun gives off. Thing is, Kepler 1649c orbits a red dwarf, meaning solar flare-ups could prevent further life from evolving, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, I don't know. No aliens, please, thanks. Number eight, Ross 128b. I love the names for all these exoplanets. It's just like Jake 21a, you're like, okay. Potentially habitable, so much monster energy. Back in 2017, this exoplanet was discovered by Xavier Bonfils at the Institute of Planetology and Astrophysics of Grenoble. Now this one is 11 light years away from us, it's pretty close, and it only takes 10 days to complete a trip around its M-type star. The star is redder, cooler, and dimmer, so perhaps this planet could one day host life. Or maybe it one day already did. Who's to say? Either way. Don't want it. Don't want any part of these aliens. Number 7. Ice Moon we're looking billions of years into the past, we're searching cosmic clouds light years away, but what about our own galaxy? What about our own solar system? What about our own moon? Could there one day be life on our moon? Back in 2018, NASA confirmed that there is surface ice on the moon's north and south pole. This was huge. NASA Mineralogy Mapper Instruments picked up ice traces near the darkest and coldest craters of the rock. There are three specific signatures that prove that there is 100% water ice on the surface of moon. Yeah, and we're talking about aliens whipping out of our oceans. Like, what's going on here? Something's, something's afoot. Number six, Loveland Flaming Thing. Nice, that's a good title. Imagine opening the newspaper back in 1957 and on the front cover you read, Leveland Flaming Thing Brings World Knocking at City's Door. That's alarming, that's a pretty crazy one. What does that even mean, right? Back in 1957 in Leveland, Texas, multiple eyewitness reports began to flood in about an egg-shaped object or this circular flash of light, something, something egg-like, jetting across Leveland skies. I just like saying Leveland, if I'm being honest. I'm trying to say it as many times as I can. I'm probably saying it wrong, it's probably like Leveland, but I'm gonna keep going with Leveland. One witness recalls the object making a loud humming noise as it flew by, which is different than other accounts that we've heard so far for, you know, UFOs. The egg shape keeps coming back in history, right? We've seen this in multiple accounts, but this is an encounter where it's been reported as loud, with a great rush of wind. And on top of that claim, the witness's car radio began to go haywire. It was like, you know, it was like, in case you missed it the first time. The radio thing isn't too crazy. I mean, growing up, my computer speakers would always tell me if a phone call was about to come in. Felt like I was from the future. That was always odd. The Air Force also commented on it, saying that this was just a phenomenon caused by electrical storms. It was a ball of lightning, they say. A ball of lightning, back in 1957. Crazy, haven't seen many of those since. Number five, 2017 UFO. Ah, uh, I remember this one, because I was really scared. Not sure what was happening with the universe. Back in 2017, after the existence of the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program became more well known, a video was then released of an encounter between an FA-18 Super Hornet and some sort of unidentified flying object. A UFO, or a UAP, sorry, we don't say UFOs anymore, now it's a UAP. There weren't a ton of details released about what exactly happened during this encounter because there weren't any details to provide, but the Raytheon Advanced Targeting Forward Locking Infrared, or all at Fleur, if you're out of breath like me, they were able to capture an extremely fast moving white oval that was around 45 feet long. The oval had no wings and didn't appear to have any kind of exhaust either. They were tracking a UFO at the altitude of 25,000 feet just above the Atlantic Ocean. And then they were shocked because the craft rotated on its side and then just flew away. There was no explanation released with the footage because it truly is unbelievable and no one can figure it out yet. If you have any ideas, sound off below. All these mystery eggs floating in and out of our towns. Number four, Europa life. One of Jupiter's moons called Europa has a red tinge around it. And in 2001, NASA scientists revealed that it's possible that alien microbes may be responsible for said red tinge. The surface of its moon is mostly icy, but it has been shown that it reflects infrared radiation in a bizarre way. This means that something is binding it together, but researchers haven't been able to come up with the correct combination of elements and compounds to make this data make any sense. Know what I mean? There's some bacteria on Earth that can thrive in extreme conditions, some fish that have never seen 
lights ever and they're glowy somehow. The surface temperature might be too cold for them to survive, but the warmer interior might be where they're all located. Some geological activity on the moon could then push them closer to the surface where they then flash frozen in place. What a horrible way to go. Number three, Venus cloud. Back in September 2020, astrobiologists everywhere were excited, but also skeptical at some new potential evidence that had been found in the upper clouds of Venus. You probably heard about this, right? Firstly, can we just take a second to really think about how cool of a job it is to be an astrobiologist? To just be like, yep, aliens, let's do it. And then they plan a mission and then take off. Anyways, phosphine is very rare, and usually it's poisonous gas here on Earth that is basically always met with the presence of living organisms, right? So we find this gas, it's bad, but always connects with life. Venus hasn't really been at the top of the list for choices for finding potential life due to its surface temperature, of course, and pressure to the, you know, sulfuric acids and the clouds, and it's horrible and you can never live there ever, but this new evidence could prove to say something otherwise. Two separate telescopes were able to pick up the signatures of phosphine in a cloud that had a similar temperature and pressure to Earth, and while this isn't concrete evidence of, you know, space beings or bugs or anything like that, it'll at least be a reminder that we should be continuing to look for life or clues around life, know what I mean? Even in the most unlikely places, like Venus clouds. Maybe it's space bugs also, who knows? That'd be gross, space moths that live in clouds with phosphine. That would suck. Number two. Astronaut sightings. We could sit on Earth all day and talk about the potential for said alien life, but who would know more than the people who have actually been to space, right? I mean, who am I? I'm just a guy who makes YouTube videos. Ask the people who have been out there, which are of course astronauts. Ask astronauts. That'd be a cool website, ask astronauts. It probably is a website, actually. Definitely on the list of the coolest and scariest jobs in the entire world. There haven't been a ton of people who have had the you know, privilege of experiencing space firsthand, but there are even less of them who have claimed to see something that could potentially prove alien existence. People who have claimed these sorts of things include Edgar Mitchell, Catherine Coleman, and Dr. Brian O'Leary. The very interesting part about many of these claims is that they will also include some sort of government cover-up as well with their claim. So it's always pretty juicy. There was also Buzz Aldrin, who spoke about his Apollo 11 experience, and he detailed the crew seeing something flying alongside them, but at first they believed it was the final stage of a detached rocket. But then Mission Control confirmed that that rocket was actually 6,000 miles away from them at the time, so there was no answers on what said flying object could have been. But they noticed it, as would you in a spaceship looking out of a window. And finally, number one, moon life. Titan is one of Saturn's many moons. Saturn has 82 moons, so if there's any aliens hiding near Saturn, we're never gonna find them. They have many places to hide. A lot of nooks and crannies to hide behind. A lot of moons to hide behind. That's a lot of moons. And around 10 years ago, NASA's Cassini spacecraft detected water under its massive shell of ice, which is really exciting. Again, like I said with our own moon, even traces of water is amazing, let alone this much. To quote a Cassini team member, the search for water is an important goal in solar system exploration, and now we've spotted another place where it is abundant. NASA has also detected low frequency radio waves on the icy moon, and it sounds pretty eerie. So we have radio waves and we have water. Sounds like aliens to me, my friends. As far as space mysteries go, anywhere that has water or signs of water, fish. Some sort of alien fish is hiding in there. Look at our own planet. Look at an octopus. An octopus changes colors while it dreams. Alien. Kicking off the list at number 10, Gliese 581G. Kicking this list off with an exoplanet hiding in the constellation Libra. Yeah, to all my fellow Libras out there, this one's for you. Happy early birthday. It was discovered back in 2010, but Gliese 581G, still to this day, its confirmation is hard to pinpoint. Yeah, the thing with exoplanets is that they're a little far away. They're a little hard to see out there. But somehow the fine minds over at the University of Puerto Rico at Arecibo calls Gliese 581 the top candidate for alien life. You heard it here, folks. There we go. It's only sitting 20 light years away from our very own sun, and Gliese 581G is three times as large as Earth. So to all my Libras, bring a friend or two. Let's party it up. We got room. If you're a fan of New Year's parties, again, this is the planet for you. Every 30 days, we're counting down to a new year. So we don't have to wait too long to party. Off to a good start. Number nine, HD 85512B. This is the next planet in HD, Chris. There you go. Put on your 3D glasses. Announced in 2011 alongside 50 other planets, Okay. HD 85512B was discovered by the High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher Instrument, or to save you some breath, HARPS for short, over in Chile. Yeah, Chile's casually exploring 50 planets. 
over there in their weekend. Okay. It's wild how some of these discoveries happened so long ago, but we don't talk about them nearly enough. Again, same deal as the Gliese 581G. This planet too, it's three times the size of Earth. It's actually 3.5 times bigger. Yeah, as far as commutes go, it'll take some time to get there. Yeah, we're still, we're still working on that part. The HD planet hides around 35 light years away from us. This one you can find in the constellation Vela, AKA the snail. Is it truly habitable? Is there water on this planet? Well, that's to be determined. Our boy James Webb's gonna take a peek real soon. Number eight, Gliese 581E. Wait a minute, how many Gleeses are there? Is a single Gliese a goose? What's going on here? In typical part two fashion, I had to include another Gliese. There's actually four of them in total. I'm not gonna do all four though. For more than four years, the HARP spectrograph attached to the ESO telescope in Chile, they were finding groundbreaking discoveries for four years straight. Astronomers found the lightest exoplanet so far to this day, the lightest planet, that's crazy. This one is quite small compared to others on this list. Gliese 581e is only twice the mass of our Earth, whereas the planet furthest out, Gliese 581d, orbits its star every 67 days while Gliese 581e completes its orbit every three days. You know what I mean? Yeah, having a birthday every three days, oh, what a nightmare that would be. I'm never going to this planet. This, this one can stay off our radar. A little small Gliese, little Gliese. Number seven, carbon on Mars. It's one thing to have Elon Musk tweeting about going to Mars or whatever he's doing over there, buying Twitter, I guess. But when NASA talks about it, I get a weird feeling, you know? It's, it's, it's NASA, you know, they're old school. They're like, we may have found carbon 40 years ago. Yeah. That's just it, that's the tweet. In 2022, just back in January, NASA's Curiosity rover measured carbon signatures on Mars. This is huge. Paul Mahaffey, principal investigator of the sample analysis at Mars, he says, quote, we're finding things on Mars that are tantalizingly interesting, but we would really need to get more evidence to say that we've identified life, end quote. Okay, so we're close. It sounds like we're a little close, I don't know. Side note, imagine going on a Willy Wonka trip to Mars with Elon. Do we wanna go? Like, he's announcing all these trips to Mars. I don't want to do that. I can't even drive to Ottawa for four hours, let alone Mars for years. No way. I'm homesick already. Number six, Ryan Graves UFO sightings. I mentioned this a little bit back in part one, but I of course have to add more. Back in 2017, a $22 million defense program was put in place. It was called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Now its purpose was to study military encounters with UFOs. And at this point, Navy pilots were coming out with their own story. Their eyewitness account of seeing a UFO UAP, or a UFO if you're old school. Eventually, come 2019, senators felt the need to be briefed on these sightings. It was that serious. After a vote by the Senate Intelligence Committee in June 2020, it was agreed that UAP reports were now to get added to the Intelligence Authorization Act for 2021 and going forward. That's crazy. That's why more and more footage is coming out now every other week. You know what I mean? These incidents were filmed ages ago, but only now are they being released. It's kind of cool. According to the Times, 120 incidents were studied during this case. And it turns out the US military is not responsible responsible for any of the 120. If they happen to be advanced drones sent to spy on the military, it's kind of important to find out who sent them. Know what I mean? And recently, a former Navy pilot, Ryan Graves, he spoke out to 60 Minutes, and he explained that these UAPs would pop up during training exercises every day for at least a couple of years. He says, and I quote, if these were tactical jets from another country that were hanging out up there, it would be a massive issue. But because it looks slightly different, we're not willing to actually look at the problem in the face. We're happy to just ignore the fact that these are out there watching us train every day. That's a quote from Ryan Graves, real pilot. And these are goosebumps for me. Awesome, I'm terrified. Are aliens real? What are we doing, man? Like, let's move on before I faint. My gosh. Number five, Milky Way radio burst. On April 28th, 2020, two radio telescopes detected an intense pulse of radio waves, and they only lasted just a millisecond, but they left astronomers baffled. The reason for this is because this was the first time a fast radio burst had been detected this close to Earth. This signal was located only 30,000 light years from Earth, which places it in our Milky Way galaxy. That's pretty damn close. The Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, or again, CHIME, if you want to save breath, they explained that the signal was so easy to pick up that CHIME wasn't even looking its direction and it still noticed the signal. It was loud and clear right in their peripheral vision. And another telescope, STARE-2, also saw it clear as day. Well, it looks like whatever the cause for the signal, someone or something, we saw it. So, now what? We found you. You can come out now. Number four, the Lorimer Burst. This is a fast radio burst that was detected long ago. This was back in 2007, and it was named, of course, after the person who spotted it. 
Duncan Lorimer. Well, actually, it was discovered when Duncan assigned his student, David Narkovec, to look through archival data taken in 2001 by the Parks Radio Dish in Australia. That's when they noticed. After analyzing this data, it was found that there was a dispersed burst that occurred on July 24th, 2001. This burst was less than five milliseconds long, and it was located just three degrees from the small megalenic cloud. It still isn't quite clear what caused said signal, but it's thought that perhaps it may have been a singular event, such as a supernova, or an Avengers level threat. One of the two. Number three, light shifts. Back in 2015, a Penn State astronomer named Jason Wright explained that there were pretty erratic and spontaneous shifts in the light that was coming from a star that was newly discovered. Yeah, shifts in light, what's, uh, what's that about? This star sits about 1,280 light years away from Earth, and these shifts were very similar as if something was passing in front of our view of the star. Scientists weren't able to connect this to any exoplanets or meteors or anything like that, so in turn, Jason whipped up an interesting theory that's lived rent-free in my head ever since. He stated that it's possible that the shifts are caused by massive objects passing in front of the star in a slow orbit, like an array of massive satellites or a structure, like the you know type of thing that would be produced by an intelligent and civilized life form. Or maybe it's an asteroid, one of the two. Either way, I'm scared, again. Number two, Mount Rainier. Not to be confused with Mount Chiliad, although there's definitely aliens there as well. Mount Rainier in Washington was bumping and buzzing back in 1947. Pilot Kenneth Arnold made the first modern report of a flying saucer, or a UAP. Apparently it was a flying egg, actually, that's what it looked like. Kenneth saw nine circular shaped objects flying in formation, the classic formation, and they were flying at twice the speed of sound. So the Idaho pilot told the Air Force and they laughed it off. They didn't believe him at all. He took this claim to his grave. Kenneth stood by what he saw until his death later in 1984. He said that he saw UAPs. He reached out to the Seattle Times in 1977, long before the movie Signs was made, and he said, I made my report because I thought it was my duty. It was the only proper and American thing to do. I saw what I saw. End quote. And also, end point. I'm, again, terrified. And finally, number one the lights. Okay, imagine you're driving home one night after a long shift at work, maybe you worked late and it's midnight. You're driving and you see a V formation, the classic formation in the sky made up of yellow and orange lights. Do you pull over? Do you assume you're just, you know, beyond exhausted and maybe this is all in your head? Because that's what I would do. Back in 2001, on July 14th, drivers along the New Jersey Turnpike saw just that. It was a touch after midnight and cars legit pulled over and people got out to get a better look at what was in the sky. Everybody looked at this thing for around 15 minutes. It was just hovering over top of the Arthur Kill waterway right between Staten Island and New Jersey. Just floating there. Just doing alien stuff. One eyewitness, Joe Mavasio, recalls the sighting as one of the most amazing most amazing, one of the most amazing things he had ever seen. And then just like that, the lights vanished. They faded out one by one in typical alien fashion. Daniel Tarrant of the Carteret Police Department recalls seeing this with his own eyes as well. It was 16 golden covered lights in a V formation. Aliens are fun and all, but keep your eyes on the roads, my friends, you know? I'm not looking at anything. Aliens are not, 10 and two, we're getting home. That's it, seatbelts, I'm checking those mirrors. No aliens back there, we're good. Starting us off at number 10, we have the sounds of Saturn. Ever since Earth's Voyager flew by, researchers have noted the cosmic storms that take place on Jupiter. There is proof of lightning and other storm-like qualities that can be heard through the crackling picked up by NASA's Cassini spacecraft. In December of 2016, as Cassini crossed Saturn's rings, it picked up all these cool and wicked sounding cosmic storm sounds. This is a case where we know exactly where this sound and signal were coming from, but to hear a cosmic storm or have a bit of evidence to what it even sounds Sounds like on Saturn, that's pretty cool. Probably wicked scary down there, but still cool nonetheless. At number nine, we have sounds of Jupiter. Over the span of its 20 years mission in space, NASA's Cassini spacecraft made a quick pit stop near Jupiter to get a gravitational boost. During its pit stop, the craft actually picked up some radio waves from Jupiter too. And basically what I mean is, is that they were able to hear what it sounds like on Jupiter. It is very alien-like and different. Along with that, the sound of a Jupiter bow shock was picked up too. The bow shock is the sound that occurs when the sun emits a steady stream of solar wind which is repelled by a string magnetic force. When the two meet, they are converted into thermal energy and make this bow shock reaction. So even though just like our number 10 spot, we know where it's coming from, it still makes it quite a little bit scary. Coming in at number 8, we have a mysterious Puerto Rico signal. Back in 2003, researchers from SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, operated a gigantic telescope in Puerto Rico to examine 200 sections of the sky and re-examine areas where they at one point had detected unknown radio signals. During this operation, they noticed that all former radio signals that were once
once detected were gone. All gone except for one. Not only did this one last signal hang in there, but it had actually gotten even stronger than before. It was coming from in between the constellations of Pisces and Aries, but there's something really strange about that. That is that this is a location that is not known to have planets or stars. So where the freaking hell is this signal coming from? The signal was at a frequency that hydrogen absorbs and creates energy. One of the most basic elements on Earth is hydrogen. So some have suspected that it could be a sign of alien life, but once again, as well with most of the others on our list, who the heck knows? At number seven, we have light shifts. In the latter half of 2015, Jason Wright, an astronomer from Penn State, claimed that there were erratic and spontaneous shifts in light coming from a newly discovered star. This star is 1,280 light years away from Earth, and these light shifts were similar to the kind of shift that occurs when something passes in front of a star. Interestingly enough, scientists weren't able to connect this back to any other exoplanet, which is what led Wright to his theory that mean it could have been a large object or objects like satellites passing in front with the same effect. You know, it doesn't have to be satellites either. It could be Tic Tacs or pyramid shaped UFOs too. Just saying, you know, because I'm pulling for our alien friends. Coming in at number six, we have the wow signal. Back in August of 1977, a radio telescope at Ohio State University detected quite the strange signal. The radio was able to pick up a pulse of radiation that seemed to have been coming from near the constellation of Sagittarius. What's funny is that this signal lasted 37 seconds long and this signal has become known to be known as the wow signal. Why? Well, because they were so shocked at the timely length of the signal that there was only one word to describe it, and that was, wow. The printout of the telescope was shocking because it was in a band of radio frequencies that are actually banned here on Earth. While many scientists are still skeptical that this was maybe a signal or sign of alien life, you can never rule it out. In science, it should always be the case to study every possible scientific outcome, no matter how crazy. The nearest star from the signal was 220 million light years away, so this is a toughie. So tough that even since 1977, we still don't have the answer. So maybe it's our super smart alien friends after all? Hmm? Coming in at our halfway point at number five, we have a zombie star. Yeah, a star that is filled with zombies. All along we thought aliens were real and zombies were fake. We had it all bass backwards. I'm just kidding. But back in April of 2020, one of the signals that scientists got back amongst our number one spot, uh, so keep watching, came from our own Milky Way galaxy. But this one specific and incredibly strong signal is said to be so strong that it could be picked up on any 4G cell phone at the time. It is also not fully proven, but believed that this signal came from a magnetar, a scientific cosmic name for a zombie star basically. And what do I mean by that? Well, when a star dies, it blows up into a supernova and then afterward collapses into a dense ball. If it becomes dense enough, then it becomes a black hole. And if not, then it turns into a neutron star. A magnetar is just a more powerful version of a neutron star basically. So it is possible that this strong signal came from the stars of yesterday, a lot of yesterdays ago. At number four, we have a beam from Proxima. Centauri. Back in 2019 in New South Wales, Australia, scientists claimed they have discovered a mysterious beam that appeared to be from the Earth's closest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri. This is a rather small star and is only around 4.2 light years away from us, which if you ask me still sounds pretty far away, but oh well. This star has an interesting exoplanet that is filled with rocks and is 17% larger than Earth's in its own habitable zone. You know what that means? Water is a possibility on the planet. And you know what that means? Where there is water, there is life. Scientists said that the signal shifted while it was being recorded because of the movement of the planet. And it is not fully explained or known how or why the planet was shifting, but I will tell you one thing, if water is actually there, then we already have our answer. It's aliens, people! Starting us off in our top three, at number three, we have HD 164595. How easy of a title is that? Which, by the way, is a name for a planet. Yeah, what a great name. I think it might be Scottish. Anyway, back in 2015, a Russian telescope detected a strong signal from a sun-like star named HD 164595. This star is located in the Hercules constellation and is 95 light years away and is 99% the size of Earth's Sun. It has one planet that is the size of Neptune and has a 40 day year. Researchers at SETI, once again, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, have not been able to identify where the signal had come from. Claudio Macone of the University of Turin in Italy told The Guardian back in 2015, the power of the signal received is not unrealistic for type 1 civilizations. Now what is a type 1 civilization? Well, basically Earth. So maybe we have Earth-like friends sending us little love notes here and there just from an oddly named star and if they do live there and exist, I really hope they have a better name for that one other than what us Earthlings gave it. 
Coming in at number two, we have the repeating radio burst. Mysterious signals and sounds from space have been known to repeat all the time. But for the first time ever, researchers have noticed a pattern in a series of bursts coming from one source half a billion light years from Earth. Usually these fast radio bursts or FRBs are sporadic and untelling. But between September 16th, 2018 and October 30th, 2019, researchers up here in Canada recorded these bursts every 16.35 days. Over the duration of four days, this signal would release two bursts each hour and then go silent for 12 days. Hmm. If they're coming in specific patterns, don't you think that means they are coming from another intelligent life source? I sure as hell do. And finally coming in at number one is a signal that is coming to us from our very own Milky Way galaxy. On April 28th of 2020, two ground based radio telescopes detected intense pulse and radio waves from outer space. While it only lasted for a millisecond, for Earth's astronomers, this is huge. This was the very first time a fast radio burst was ever recorded this close to Earth. It was only 30,000 light years away from Earth. Yeah, pretty close, right? I mean, the Canadian Hydro Intensity Mapping Experiment and the Survey for Transient Astronomical Radio Emissions, say that two times fast, or CHIME and STARE for short, had no problems whatsoever picking up this millisecond signal. What makes this really exciting is that Earth scientists are getting closer and closer to tracking down where these FRBs are coming from. And now to finally have one from our very own Milky Way galaxy, that's a mega win. Maybe we aren't just alone. Maybe we even have galactic neighbors closer than we originally thought. At number 10, Mars Quake. On May 5th, 2018, NASA launched the InSight Mars Lander and it was designed to give the planet its first thorough checkup since being formed. This technology allows us to collect lots of data like hearing what's going on inside of the planet. Compared to Earth, the interior of Mars is fairly quiet, but it still experiences quakes underneath the surface. The InSight Lander is equipped with a seismometer called Seismic Experiment for Interior Structure, or they just call it size, which picks up on the different vibrations of the planet and allow scientists to hear what the heck is going on inside. In April 2019, the size got its first hit which turned out to be, for the first time ever, a Mars quake. This is the first recorded trembling that appears to have come from inside the planet as opposed to being caused by forces above the surface like wind. Most people are familiar with quakes on Earth which are caused by the moving of tectonic plates. Mars does not have tectonic plates like the moon, but they both still experience quakes. In this case, they are caused by a continual process of cooling and contraction that creates stress. The stress then builds over time until strong enough to break the crust. The audio of the quake is very ominous sounding, almost like a really strong wind, but since space is so silent, it makes things super ominous. It's not so terrifying until you remember it's coming from inside of the planet. Number 9. The Sun Considering space is such a quiet place, it really seems like everything in it makes a lot of noise. The Sun is no exception. I was totally happy before this video not thinking about the Sun making noise, but now now I'm afraid it's all I will be able to think of. The sun has so much energy coming out of it that it vibrates on multiple frequencies at once, which then cause a humming sound. To me, the sun sounds like one of those singing bowls used in meditation. It's almost soothing until you remember that you're listening to the sun vibrate. NASA explained how we're able to hear the sun, and basically, when anything material moves, waves travel through it, and the same thing happens inside the sun. Those waves are bouncing around the sun, and if our eyes were sensitive enough, we could actually see this jiggle. Since our human eyes are so useless and weak, scientists turn that jiggle into a sound. Like Mars, we want to know what's going on inside, and thanks to the sun vibrating at many different frequencies, we can use those vibrations to look inside. Now scientists can see huge rivers of solar material flowing around and are starting to finally understand the layers of the sun. Number 8. Crossing Saturn's Rings October 15, 1997 marks the day that the Cassini Huygens was launched. Commonly just called Cassini was a space research mission by NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Italian Space Agency to send a space probe to study the planet Saturn and its systems, including its rings and natural satellites. Cassini was the fourth space probe to visit Saturn and the first to enter its orbit where it stayed from 2004 to 2007. During this mission, one of the things they discovered, unfortunately, was what it sounds like to cross the planet's rings. Saturn's rings are made up of billions of small chunks of ice and rock coated with other materials such as dust. The audio clip sounds mainly like static, but but as it goes, you can hear more action and the sound becomes more intense. It's almost like the sound of a really heavy rain. Cassini's initial dive into the void of Saturn's rings was on April 26, 2017, when the sounds were recorded. Not only was this our first time hearing what this section of space sounds like, it's the first time a spacecraft has ever ventured into the gap between the
the planet and its rings. The sound is so loud it's hard to believe that scientists were surprised to see just how empty it was. At number 7, Earth Whistle. This sound is terrifying because it sounds like something straight out of a video game. Space is far from empty and as we are learning today, it's not very quiet either. Space contains energetic charged particles governed by magnetic and electric fields and it behaves like nothing we've ever experienced on Earth before. Particles are continually tossed to and fro by the motion of various electromagnetic waves known as plasma waves. The plasma waves create a rhythmic noise that with the right tools we can hear across space. Basically, the waves create distinct sounds depending on the plasma they travel through. For example, the region tied around the Earth called the plasma sphere is pretty dense with cold plasma. Waves traveling inside the region might sound much different to those outside of it. Beyond the plasma sphere where it's warmer, waves can create a high pitched chirping sound like a flock of noisy birds. If you look up earth whistle, it sounds like the classic laser gun sound effect or like crickets and frogs at night. Either way, it sounds fake and it's hard to believe it was recorded right by earth in space. Number 6, Jupiter. Everyone thinks aliens live on Mars. Due to its similarities to earth, maybe it is the one housing another life form. I would agree it makes a lot of sense that aliens are hanging out on Mars. That was until I heard what it sounds like on Jupiter. I mentioned earlier Cassini, the spacecraft that was sent on a mission to check out Saturn. Well, Cassini had a historic 20 year mission to Saturn and while in space it stopped by Jupiter to receive a gravitational boost en route to its final destination. Cassini flew by Jupiter in January 2001 while it was flying by, it captured some spooky alien like radio signals. Of all the sounds on this list, the ones on Jupiter sound the most like aliens. The other sounds were spooky but this one sounds almost animated, perhaps like a conversation even. Apparently the sound comes from waves that were derived from an interaction of the magnetic field that surrounds Jupiter and the solar wind of particles speeding away from the sun. At number 5, unusually close signals. There are bright fleeting blasts of radio waves coming from the vicinity of a nearby galaxy and they are only pushing one of astronomy's biggest mysteries even further from an answer. The repeating bursts of energy seem to be coming from an ancient group of stars called a globular cluster. What's so special about that? Well, it's one of the last places astronomers expected to find them. These extremely bright and extremely brief bursts of radio waves are known as fast radio bursts or FRBs. Originating billions of light years away, the FRBs have defied explanation since they were first spotted in 2007. Based on observations, scientists infer that the bursts are powered by young, short lived cosmic objects called magnetars. That was until a couple of years ago when a fast radio burst was discovered and traced to a globular cluster about 11.7 million light years away near the neighboring spiral galaxy M81. At number 4, Space Roar. In space, nobody can hear you scream, but scientists did pick up on what they described as a roar. I don't know if you could find a scarier sound coming from space. Back in 2006, scientists began looking for distant signals in the universe using a complex instrument attached to a huge balloon that was sent to space. The instrument is called the Absolute Radio Meter for Cosmology, Astrophysics, and Diffuse Emissions, or just Arcade. The Arcade was able to pick up radio waves from the heat of distant stars, but none of them were expecting what they heard next. The instrument listened from a height of about 23 miles and it picked up a signal that was 6 times louder than what it had originally been expected. They tried to source the loud sound but soon discovered it was too loud to be early stars and far louder than the predicted combined radio mission from distant galaxies, so basically scientists were stumped. Even today we still have no idea what the source of the roar was. Apparently on top of not knowing the source, the mysterious sound is so loud that it's making the efforts to search for signals from the first stars formed after the Big Bang quite difficult. It's just out there covering up our view of early stars and being emitted by something we can't yet imagine. Number 3, Space Heartbeat Mystery. Mysterious radio signals from space have been known to repeat, but a few years back for the first time, researchers noticed a pattern in a series of bursts coming from a single source half a billion light years away from Earth. Fast radio bursts or FBRs which I mentioned before are millisecond long bursts of radio waves in space. Individual radio bursts emit once and don't repeat, but repeating FRBs are known to send out the waves multiple times. Usually when they repeat it's sporadic or in a cluster according to previous observations. Between September 16, 2018 and October 30th, 2019, researchers with the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment or CHIME detected a pattern in bursts occurring every 16.35 days. Over the course of 4 days, the signal would release a burst or two each hour, then it would go silent for another 12 days. In 2019, CHIME detected the sources of 8 new repeating fast radio bursts, including this signal. The repeating signal was traced to a massive spiral galaxy around 5 
500 million light years away. Researchers hope that by tracing the origin of these mysterious bursts, they would be able to determine what caused them, but to this day, scientists still have no idea. I know I mentioned aliens a lot, but come on. If anything is another life form trying to get in communication with us, it has to be this. What else would be able to stay so consistent in space? Number 2 Jupiter's Bow Shock Well, we all know now that I think Jupiter is home to aliens already, but after hearing Jupiter's bow shock, I don't know if I'm more or less convinced. The sun emits a steady stream of charged solar wind, which can be repelled by a very strong magnetic force, like that of the magnetic field of a larger planet. When the solar wind meets a strong magnetic force surrounding a planet, it's deflected, and all its energy of motion is converted to thermal energy. This energized region is known as a bow shock. The name is borrowed from a similar phenomenon in aerodynamics. The sound of passing through this region was recorded by the Voyager spacecraft. Voyager 1 and 2 were both launched into space in 1977 to take advantage of a favorable alignment of Jupiter and Saturn. When the spacecraft encountered the bow shock, there was a very sudden burst of intense low frequency emissions extending over a wide range of frequencies. To me, the bow shock on Jupiter sounds like the little aliens are just chilling, chattering away, and then explosion. It sounds like something big blows up, and the tone of it is much deeper than the high pitch of Jupiter itself. Once again, remembering that the sound was recorded in space makes it even crazier. And at number 1, black hole. Okay, of all the sounds you can hear from space, a black hole is the scariest. I think also just in general, black holes are one of the scariest things that exist. First of all, what the heck is a black hole? Well, according to NASA, a black hole is a place in space where gravity pulls so much that even light cannot get out. Horrifying. The gravity is so strong because the matter has been squeezed into a tiny space. This can happen when a star is dying. Because no light can get out, people can't see black holes. They are invisible. Space telescopes with special tools can help find black holes. The special tools can see how stars that are very close to black holes act differently than other stars. The sound that a black hole makes is even more haunting. I've never heard a more fitting sound effect for a spine chilling scene in a horror movie. It sounds like what I think hundreds of ghosts and spirits would sound like if they were to circle around a spooky dungeon. Maybe it's just me, but I seriously think it's the sound they used in Harry Potter when they were at Azkaban. Starting off this countdown, we have the alien signal. Back in 2016, we received a signal from a nearby star, and some people believe that it was sent by aliens. So the star is in the constellation Hercules. It's about 95 light years away, which seems far. Because it is, but it's relatively close according to the universe's scale. Anyways, this star is said to have at least one planet and it's roughly the size of Neptune, and it's thought to have the right conditions to support life. So could this planet have life on it? Who knows? But let's talk about this signal. It was so strong that they believed it came from a Kardashev type 2 civilization. A type 1 civilization can use and store energy from a nearby star like us, whereas type 2 can harness the energy from the entire star, meaning it makes that planet more advanced. So it may just be that the signal was sent from extremely advanced life forms. Moving on to number 9, we have the wow signal. If you guys are liking this video so far, then smash that like button because it really helps us out. Also, don't know what that was, but hit the like button for me. Thanks. On the night of August 15th, 1977, an Ohio State University radio telescope received a quite fascinating signal. The signal lasted 72 seconds and it was intense. More intense than anything in the sky that night. Now the signal did not repeat, and over the years, people have tried to find it again, but all attempts have failed. It was like a one-off. The signal is said to have come from deep space, in an area that is relatively free of noise from other objects. Now it was given the name the WOW signal because when reviewing the data, Jerry Amen was so shocked by it that he wrote WOW next to it. Still to this day, we have no clue what caused the signal, but it was pretty significant. Wow. Owen Wilson, wow. Moving on to number eight, we have the Soyuz 11. On June 6, 1971, three Soviet cosmonauts launched into space. Their goal was to make a record for the longest time spent in space. Sadly, the mission failed and they became the first people to die in space. While in space, their breathing ventilation valve ruptured. All three sadly died from decompression. The last message they sent to Earth was them trying to scream for help, but they couldn't. So all they heard was them gasping for air and then weird popping sounds, which is from the air in their lungs expanding from the drop in air pressure and being exposed to the vacuum of space. 
The worst part? The spacecraft survived re entry into Earth and landed perfectly. But when the hatch was open, they found the dead crew inside. Their faces filled with dark blue splotches and blood dripping from their ears and noses. Moving on at number seven, we have the 13 signals. Back in 2019, the Chime Observatory in British Columbia, Canada picked up a very strange signal. They observed 13 of the same signals. These are what they call FRBs or fast radio bursts. You're probably like, Psh, okay, what's the big deal? Well, all of the 13 bursts came from the same location and they were 1.5 billion light years from Earth. And detecting that is super uncommon. It's only been seen once before. So 13 at the same location and time, that's suspicious. A number of people think that it was someone or something signaling for help. Could it be life on another planet? Aliens? Who knows? In our sixth spot today, we have the pattern. This next signal is pretty terrifying and that's because it appears like clockwork. So basically the signal will chime for four days, then after the fourth day, it stops making that weird noise. It stops for 12 days before picking up again and doing the same thing over and over again. It's thought that maybe on the days where it's not sending a signal towards us, it's actually sending a signal in another direction. Some believe that this is coming from aliens or other life forms. Whereas others think that it's a star sending out radio waves and then orbiting by something that could be blocking the signal for 12 days and then returning to a position where we can hear it. It's just incredibly mysterious and we don't know what to make of it. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the mysterious flashes. Another very strange and mysterious signal that we have yet to figure out. So astronomers have detected a signal that will beam to Earth for 90 days before being silent for 67 days. They noticed that this pattern would repeat every 157 days. Its cycle is that precise. The signal is being sent from a distant galaxy and this pattern has been happening since 2016. Furthermore, the signal is quite strong. It unleashes as much energy as our sun does in a century, in just a few milliseconds. Like what? the actual hell is going on. Theory goes that aliens have created a powerful machine that has the capability of sending out this strong signal, but then it needs 157 days to recharge itself before continuing on. But who knows? In our fourth spot today, we have the eerie sounds. This is quite possibly one of the creepiest things I have ever heard. So NASA decided to gather all of the creepy sounds that they have ever heard and put it all together on SoundCloud for us to enjoy. It literally sounds like aliens communicating with each other or something like that. NASA refers to these sounds as moans and whistles from the universe. Isn't that just great? Moving on to number three, we have the pulse of radio waves. Just recently on April 28th, 2020, two telescopes detected an intense pulse of radio waves. Now the signal only lasted for a millisecond, but astronomers were blown away by this and said it's a major discovery. Why? Well, this is the first time a fast radio burst has ever been detected so close to Earth. The signal came from the Milky Way. In fact, Chime wasn't even looking for it, but it was so loud and clear that they caught it anyways. They said that this burst is helping them discover what these things are and where they're coming from. Maybe we'll find out if there's aliens out there sooner than we thought. Moving on to number two, we have the lost cosmonaut. A lot of people refer to this next story as an urban legend, but with the facts I'm about to provide you with, it might just change your mind. So legend goes that back in the 1950s to 60s, two brothers were working as amateur radio operators. One day they were listening in on space when they heard what sounded like a cosmonaut returning to Earth's orbit. They managed to record her final moments. Her spacecraft was malfunctioning and in the recording the woman speaking in Russian is pleading for help, saying it's getting hot, it's getting hot, because the craft was burning up. <laughs>
Turns out that her spacecraft caught on fire and she was frantically sending messages hoping someone would hear it and somehow help her. But the Soviet Union just sent her up there and left her to die. Now the Soviets denied this saying that it was an unmanned craft that burned. But the thing is, a lot of cosmonauts died during the space race and they refused to reveal a number of those deaths. Half the time they would just cover them up. So this recording could be real. And in our number one spot today we have the final words. In 1967, Soviet test pilot, aerospace engineer and cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov was sent into space on the Soyuz 1. However, the mission did not go according to plan and the spacecraft was extremely faulty. But Vladimir didn't really have a say in going on this mission, he kind of felt forced to do so. He said that if he didn't go, then the backup pilot would have had to go, which was his best friend and he said he didn't want to do that to his friend, so he went and sacrificed his life instead. He knew the mission was going to fail and he was right. Once he began to orbit Earth, a number of issues began to happen such as the antennas not opening up properly. The worst came to him on his re-entry into Earth. On April 24th, 1967, during his re-entry, the parachutes failed to open. The signals he sent to Earth were haunting. On his way down, translators heard him say heat was rising in the capsule. He then began to curse the people who put him inside of this botched spaceship, saying they killed him. His final moments were him cursing and crying in rage. Imagine hearing that and listening to a man's final words. It's very haunting. Mm -hmm. 